Happy Tuesday, everyone. I hope you had a phenomenal day so far, but it's about to get even better because you're on the avenue. holiday season and one of the many ways that Wheeler Avenue seeks to be a blessing to the community is through our nonprofit organization the Central City Comprehensive Community Center also known as 5 C's. Wheeler Avenue 5 C's was started in 1976 with the purpose of serving minority and economically disadvantaged individuals groups and neighborhoods. Within the organization, there are many different programs that seek to meet the needs of people who have found themselves in difficult situations and need help. This month, we will be hearing from the leaders of some of the programs under 5Cs so that we can get a better understanding of some of the work that goes on at Wheeler Avenue outside of Sunday morning worship. Last week, Reverend Benita Barnes, the director of our social services department, Matthew 25, shared what they do on a daily basis to help meet the needs of the community. She also shared details on how we're still working to serve meals to the homeless and hungry for our annual Thanksgiving feast. Of course, things will look differently this year, but if you're interested in finding out more about these efforts, scroll back to last week's episode on Facebook and YouTube. This week, we're welcoming Katherine Sanders, director of the Madge Bush Transitional Living Center. Ms. Sanders is new to the Wheeler Avenue team, so today we're going to get to know a little bit more about who she is and the work that she will be doing in this new role. Well, hello. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Sanders. How are you? I'm blessed. Thank you. Good. Thank you for having me. Of course. So you've been named the new director of the Match Bush Transitional Living Center. Can you first give us a little bit of a background about yourself? Well, I've been in social services now for over 30 years. Um, 24 of those years, I've been directors of homeless facilities. Just recently, I was the shelter director for Fort Bend Women's Center. And um, it's an agency to assist domestic violence and sexual assault survivors and their children. Nice. So... What was that like? How big of an issue is homelessness in the city of Houston? Well, now even a greater issue because of COVID. Um, we found that, uh, as a matter of fact, domestic violence has been on the rise because of COVID. Because normally before, there was a break. Maybe the husband went to one job, um, the mom went to the, another, and the children were in school. And so a lot of the personalities didn't have to fuse 24 seven. And um, so domestic violence has really been on the rise lately because of COVID and homelessness in general. Um, a lot of the stimulation uh, packets have helped some, but because Houston is more of an entertainment type uh, city, as far as uh, restaurants and things of that nature, um, it's been real difficult as far as homelessness. So you would say that um, there is a direct correlation between domestic violence cases and homelessness. Are women and children fleeing domestic situations and becoming homeless as a result? Well, that was happening really before COVID, but yes. Um, but I think right now, because of COVID, a lot of that, a lot of the women are staying put hmm. for fear of the um, pandemic. So, um, okay. for, those, for those watching who don't know, um, who aren't familiar with Madge Bush, can you explain what the facility is and who you help? Madge Bush is um, a facility for mothers with up to two children. They're referred here from um, directly from homeless shelters or we work with HISD homeless department, families homeless department as well. 
Nice. So when do you, do you accept applications year round? Are there any specific eligibility requirements? Well, there are, there's, uh, right now we're in a process of restructuring the program and um, there are qualifications for the program. But right now, because of the restructure and the pandemic and things that's going on, we won't be accepting anybody uh, other than the clients we already have here into January, right after Christmas. Nice. Okay. So speaking of the holidays, um, each year, Wheeler Avenue, um, we normally, a few of us go down to Match Bush and we take, you know, Christmas trees and stockings and we just have a little mini celebration there with the families. Of course, that's probably going to look different this year because of, you know, COVID and everything. But how can people still help and who would like to be a blessing? Can do, Are you accepting donations, um, not just for Christmas, but for um, even year round? Well, we do, but right now what we're trying to do is work out some additional space so we can sort and, and go through the donations and um, assist the women that way with their needs. And uh, we do have some agencies coming in to assist over the holiday with the festivities for the ladies, but they're doing it uh, in a safe way because of the pandemic. So uh, we're grateful for that. So speaking, you know, of course, almost all of our conversations have to deal with the pandemic these days. And I know in your facility, it's a small facility and the families, you know, are used to being in close quarters. How have you guys adjusted to COVID um, in the facility? Well, right now, every, all the classes are done um, online. Uh, with the with zoom and also when we meet with the ladies it's with emo or uh duo so it's working out great that way nice well thank you for joining the team we're wishing you the very best and on your new journey working at match bush um looking forward to all of the great things do you have any any vision for where this ministry is going to go in the future well, right now, what we're doing is really focusing on, um, it's like a, um, it takes a village to raise a child type concept. And we're getting input from the pastor and my supervisor and other um, members of the congregation. But one thing I wanted to say, um, the reason why I felt that I was in the right place, we were delivering meals the other day myself and um, a co-worker from Matthew 25, Bobby. And while we were delivering meals, we saw a young lady walking down the street and she was carrying everything. You could tell that she had a, a rough, she had a rough time at it. So, and it was the first time I had an opportunity to really work with Bobby. And I looked at her and I said, I wonder if she's hungry, if she needs something to eat. And she looked at me and she and we looked over at her, the young lady that was in the street, and we both called her and asked, and I asked, was she hungry? And she said, yes, ma'am. And I asked her to follow us back to the office. And of course we had our mask right. on. <laughs> I asked her to follow me back to the office. And when she followed me back to the office, while she was sitting waiting for me um, to get a care package together for her, including food and some other items, um, Bobby was praying for her. Wow. Nice. So, and that's, that's why I knew I was in the right place. It felt it just felt like I belong. Yeah. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to be able to have an opportunity to assist in the ministry that you have. Thank you. That's what it's all about. Thank you so much um, for joining the team. And thank you for this story, for that wonderful story. That was really nice. Um, so I'm looking forward to all of the great things that Madge Bush will be doing in the future. And thank you for stopping by virtually to speak with us today. As you all know, we are Wheeler wherever. 
And this month, we began to showcase that reality by highlighting Black-owned business owners who are members of our church. Last week, we heard from Brother Jonathan Howard, who opened a Smoothie King location two years ago, and we are so glad to see his business continuing to do well. This week, we are excited to welcome Deacon and Deaconess Hugh and Karen Tillman. Last year, the Tillmans became the proud owners of a Jamba Juice franchise in Missouri City, Texas. Their location is the largest of nine locations in the Houston market. But what's even more amazing is that they are the first and only African-American owners of a Jamba Juice franchise in the entire state of Texas. Listen up because this is going to be good. Welcome to On the Avenue, Deacon and Deaconess Tillman. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for having us. Of course. So you two are the first and only African-American owners of a Jamba Juice location in the state of Texas. There's so much to talk about right there. Um, first of all, whose idea was this and why Jamba? Well, Jamba, because a couple years ago um, when we started the first Daniel Fast here at Wheeler, I was a Smoothie King girl. My husband actually used to own a smoothie factory years ago, wow. and we could not go to either one of those places during Daniel. And so uh, one day I went down the block. There happened to be a Jamba Juice on the same street as Smoothie King and went into the Jamba, and they actually have a vegan menu, and we were able to have so many options on that menu. And we've been Jamba Juice ever since. So we used to go all the time as a family and say, you know, we're here so much, we ought to buy one one day. Right. <laughs> and that's what happened. <laughs> Wow, nice. So you guys are healthy people, obviously. So did your healthy lifestyle have any influence um, over that decision when you were going through that thought process? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you need to be passionate about whatever it is that you want to own, particularly from a franchise perspective. And you know, we didn't see ourselves as owning a chicken shack or a donut shop. It was, it was something that we wanted to ensure really um, was close to our heart, A, and then really kind of Hit, on, hit home in terms of who we are. Uh, that healthy lifestyle is big for us. Uh, we have our days when we kind of slide away and want to <laughs> cheat, uh, but, but for the most part, we were pleased with uh, the menu offerings that Jamba Juice had, uh, and they, those are always changing. Um, so it, it made sense, it made sense for us. So have you ever had any type of experience in the food and beverage industry? Yeah, so as she mentioned, I used to own a, a a competitor franchise, right. yeah, so, so Smoothie Factory, uh, many, many years ago. And it allowed me to, to kind of see some of the inner workings of, of what it was like. Uh, it was a place that I always went. I worked out. I'm a bit of a gym rat. Uh, <laughs> and I, I got to a place where I thought, okay, I want to not just work for someone else. I want to have my own gig. I've always worked in food service industry since I was in high school. It's just close to my heart. I enjoy uh, just that industry, helping people, uh, watching the, the smiles on faces when you provide a you know, good service and a good product. Uh, so for me, it made sense. And I did that for a couple of years. I sold it, and I'd always said, I, I got to get back in it, got to get back in it. So it, it made sense. And it actually was very, very helpful uh, as part of the application process. I actually needed that particular uh, level of experience in order for us to close the deal. Wow. So with this industry, you do have to have some type of background on your resume that relates to the food and beverage industry. You do. It, it certainly is going to be helpful. And then for us, we were so unique in that I owned that. My background from a professional perspective is human resources. For my wife, it's sales. So you marry human resources, sales, and that. It just, it all kind of came together. So from what I heard, um, businesses already take a few years to get up and running. But with yours being the largest in the Houston area, how long did it take from step one to the grand opening? Step one started in about June of 2018. Okay. And then our grand opening was Mother's Day weekend of 2019. So May of 2019, so about a year and a half. Nice. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit for a second. Um, in the climate in which we find ourselves, African Americans are experiencing what seems like more blatant displays of prejudice and racism. And many of us are taught our whole lives that we have to be twice as good, um, if not more, to get the same results, particularly in the workforce. Um, were there any extra hurdles you had to jump to get this business started just because you're black and you guys are the first and only black owners in the state of Texas? So I can, re I can recall uh, when we first went to the Dallas area, um, and I remember my wife told me, she said, this isn't over yet. We're, we're, they're, they're smoking us over just like we're smoking them over. <laughs> so we can't, I was going to wear jeans, and she's like, no, 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 we got we to gotta yeah. come with it. Wow. And we showed up, 
and people were dressed up, and, and she was right. They were vetting us still all the way to the very end of the process. Now, the thing that we did like about Jamba Juice, or Jamba then, um, as their name had changed, um, they had people of color in high-level positions. So their CFO, their chief operating officer were African-Americans. Okay. Uh, and when we walked in, we just lit up. <laughs> and so from that perspective, we didn't feel like we were shoe-ins, but it, it just showed us that this is a company that believes in, you know, having people of color in those kinds of positions that you normally don't see. Yeah. That was a good sign right away. Now, in terms of the whole process, um, soup to nuts, we did have one hurdle with one bank, which I'll always feel like because of the color of our skin, when they saw us, we didn't get that loan. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't say for sure. It just, it felt like in some of those conversations, and, and my wife can speak to it as well, I just feel like they didn't, they didn't treat us like we needed because we had plenty of equity. We had plenty of experience, credit scores through the roof. We had everything that we needed, and yet they came back with an, you know, a reason. Right. Um, now, we obviously got a great SBA from a different bank that worked out better, but yeah, it, that's still there. It's still a challenge to be a person of color trying to get your business going. It's, it's still there. It's still tough. Hmm. Well, you all were also hit with a global pandemic less than a year into opening your business. What has that been like? So true. Um, of course, with any new business, it takes a while, uh, a year and a half to two years to even break even sometimes and then even longer to, wow. until you're profitable. And so to your point, to be hit uh, in the midst of, you know, just being open six or so months with the pandemic was definitely a setback. But thankfully for us, uh, we were able to, in the fall, register with third-party vendors to do delivery, third-party delivery. So DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats, Postmates. And we did that in advance of the pandemic. And that really saved us during the pandemic because when everything was shut down, we were able to have those third-party deliveries kind of keep our business afloat. And then also um, applying for the government um, assistance for COVID relief fund, that really helped us and nice. allowed us to not be able to lay off any employees with PPP. So what are some of the changes that you all have had to make in the store? Uh, a, lot of thing, a lot of things around um, safety and cleanliness, obviously. So the, you know, we have social distancing stickers on the floor. We've got sanitation stations there. We've got to sanitize the front and back of the house uh, every 30 minutes. Uh, our, our team members have to wear gloves, masks. Uh, you know, all that stuff now has to happen all the time. So I have to con constantly stay on them. And we like to, I'm in the store all the time. So that's kind of my full-time gig. Okay. Um, my wife, not, not so much, but she'll come in. We'll show up anytime and we'll be on it. If it looks like it hadn't been mopped, if it looks like, you know, like, hey, hey, it's, it's a new day. Uh, so those are the kind of things that we have to do now uh, with regard to the PPE that's required. And that's required by Jamba. And even after this pandemic, um, you know, when we have vaccines and we get back to some semblance of normalcy, that's not going to change. Right. Gloves are still going to be required. Some of the things we've instituted, which are best practices now in the industry, is going to stay around. And I think it's a good thing. Good. Well, thank you so much. Where can we find your store? And if you're on social media, can you give us those handles as well? For sure. We're located at 9303 Highway 6, Suite 100 in Missouri City in front of Sienna Plantation. And you can find us at Sienna Jamba on Instagram and Facebook. Nice. Thank you so much for joining us. Everybody, please make sure that you make your way down to the Jamba Juice location on Highway 6, right. Sienna Plantation. Thank you so Thanks much. Is. Thank you. Thank you for having me. To learn more about the nonprofit work of Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church, visit www.wheelera5cs.org. Also, make sure that you do what you can to support the business owners in your life and in our church. We've come to the end of another show. As always, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed us this week, make sure that you like and share this video and drop a few comments to let us know your favorite parts of the show. Be sure to tune in next week as we talk more about what Thanksgiving week at Wheeler Avenue will look like this year. And remember, even though we can't be together yet, you are still on the avenue.